So hello everyone. So in the previous two sessions, we have been discussing about these vectors. Okay, we discussed a lot about vectors. So we said, from a computer science perspective, these vectors are nothing but just an array of numbers. Okay, so they are an array of numbers. So what I mean by array of numbers, not uh, taking the DS array. So I'm little meaning of array is basically a run of numbers. So now we'll see what are these, what are what, uh, what are the uses of these vectors. So first we'll see, let's suppose as I said, anything that uh, you have in the inside the computer that basically is numbers. Okay, now the data can be, so if you have data, so it, in the human form, uh, we see a lot of data in data to life. So the, for the first data we see is text. Okay, we usually see the text and we read the books, text, uh, we read uh, these research papers and other things. We see images. Okay, all of these are, this is data. And then we see probably audio. We hear audio rather. Okay, text we see, we have image and then we have audio. And then probably we see the, and uh, maybe one more thing we have, we have numeric data. Numeric data. Okay, there may be some other types of data, but more or less, I can tell you that these four types of data are there which you see in the day to day life. Let's suppose if you read a text in the morning, the textbook or research paper, that is basically text and some numeric data in there. And there will be a bunch of images. If you look at the world, you see the world in a 3D view. It, it basically is a uh, bunch of uh, images, uh, like continuous images. And then audio, you listen to something. So this is the data. So now computer only understands numbers. Okay, so you understand this. If there is numeric data, we can directly store it into a computer and then we can convert it into binary. But what about this text, image, and audio? So all of these things are converted. Okay, all of these things are converted into uh, into numbers first. So if you talk about text, okay, we have text. Let's suppose I am writing like this. Uh, we are studying AIML. Okay, this is a text. This is a sentence. But how will we represent this in computer science? Okay, how will we represent this in computers so that computers understand it? So there are a lot of techniques by which we represent this. So that's the first challenge we had. We had how to represent these. So what we did is we came up with these vectors. What do we call them? We call them as embeddings. We call them as text embeddings. So text embeddings are nothing but vectors, bunch of vectors, okay, which represent this data, which represent these texts, okay. And there are a lot of techniques which we'll study probably in coming uh, lectures. So something there is something called as TFIDF, okay, term frequency inverse document frequency. Okay, this is one of the techniques by which you can convert these text into vectors. You can just cover these, in, these into vectors. So let's suppose you have sentence one, then you have sentence two or something. So you'll take each the sentence and you will convert them into a vector. So a vector will be just a bunch of numbers, something like this, two, four, one, six, something like this. Okay, this is one technique. TFIDF is one of the techniques by which we convert this text into the vector. Okay, but uh, why, why am I talking about vectors now? Because I said every data is basically converted into numbers because computer only understands numbers and in those numbers we only understand binary. But we have, we know that uh, if we have numbers, let's suppose in decimal or other system, who can convert them into binary? Now, we had a good lecture or detailed lecture on, in the programming session uh, where we talked about how to convert these things. So now we have somehow established this computer only understands numbers. Now, as we saw, data is of different types, okay? At least we categorize them into four data types, text, image, audio, and numeric data. So numeric data is done because it's already numeric. We don't need to convert it. But what about this text? So I said, uh, for, for textual data, we need to convert them into vectors. So one of the techniques is called as TFIDF. Okay, term frequency, inver inverse document frequency. And there is something called as bag of words. Okay, bag of words model. And then there are different versions of these bag of, bag of words. And then uh, right now what we are using is basically called as word to vec. Okay, and then there is something called as glow. This is by Google. Okay, and in that there are a lot of techniques. So from here I think deep learning starts. So these are deep learning based techniques. And this word to vec basically how do we train it? It's called something called as skip grams. I'm just throwing the terms here because uh, what I'm telling you is we have text. The text is to be converted into a vector. So how do we convert that? We have a lot of algorithms. Okay, this this is an active research topic. How do we convert text into these vectors? And I think state of the art is this glow, and we use these word to vex with skip grams, and because they uh, contain what's called as contextual meaning. So here at least we have sem semantic meanings also. So this text is to be converted into vectors, but because our computer only understands vectors, so this is how uh, this textual data is basically a vector inside a computer. Okay, because we have been studying vectors for uh, since uh, two lectures, so I wanted you to tell that this text is nothing but a vector. Now if you have image, and we have been taking example of image, so image basically we take pixel values. So 
an image just for the completion. So we have an image like this. So I told you that each pixel, if it's colored, basically has three values. That is R, G, and V. So it has red, green, and blue. And each of the value can be 0 to 255. Okay, now each of the pixel is basically represented by three numbers. Or what you can say is, so images are also represented by vectors. Okay, so then coming to the audio. How is audio a vector? So in audio, we have something called as frequency coefficients. Okay, audio signals can be transformed into vectors uh, of the frequency components using technique called as Fourier transform. Okay, Fourier transform. So this is the technique by which we take these uh, uh, we take uh, these vectors and they basically are frequencies. Okay, and we break them component wise and we use this. Uh, Fourier transform. We break a uh, complex signal into its constituent frequencies and then add them. And they basically are called as spectrograms. Okay, so audio is converted to what's called as spectrograms. So spectrogram is nothing but vectors. Okay, so if you have an audio signal, let's suppose A1, audio signal A2, so corresponding to that, there will be vectors. There will be these bunch of numbers. Okay, and it, it depends on the uh, dimension. How many how, how many detailing do you want? If you want more details, you'll, you'll keep on adding more numbers. So that's what this for for, uh, for this image will be clear. Let's suppose you want a good image quality. You so you usually say so it is this megapixel. So megapixel means so these many pixels are there. So mega basically means ten to the power six. These many pixels are there. So if you have more pixels, you basically have more information in that. Okay, if let's suppose I to usually take twenty eight plus twenty eight. That's seven eighty four pixels. This is a very low quality image. Okay, but if you want to increase the resolution, what you basically do is you have more pixels. So more pixels basically means more information. So because each pixel has some information. Okay, so you have 50 megapixels. So that means if you have an if you have your image, so in that image these many pixels will be uh, 50 into 10 to the power six pixels will be embedded into that uh, into that image. And these these many sort of data uh, data will be there. These many pixels and each pixel has is uh, described with three numbers okay so if one number let's suppose takes a space of let's suppose one number takes it is uh, 0 to uh, 256 that is 8 bits 8 bits means one byte so one byte uh, multiplied by these many into 50 megapixel into 50 into 10 to the power 6 okay these many bytes it will take these many bytes of storage so uh, the more you increase the uh, pixels the more information this image contains and the uh, size will be larger so that's what I'm saying here. So the more audio quality you want, so you'll have to increase the image. You'll have to increase the information and it will correspondingly increase the vector size. So in here we had only 784 numbers. So in here if you see we have a lot of numbers now and this is the storage. And if you see, uh, we can sometimes have, let's suppose, an image in which we have 1000 cross 1000 pixels. So that gives us 10 to the power 6 pixels. So this much dimension, this much dimensional vector we will have. So the uh, more quality you want, so you increase the dimensions. Okay, and in the spectrograms, you'll do the same. Okay, I was talking about the first thing I talked about was text. How do we convert text? So we have different techniques by which we convert this text into what's called as text embeddings. So text embeddings are nothing but vectors. Okay, then we said if we have an image, we know each of the images are made up of pixels. So pixels have, if it's a colored image, we have RGB. So in that we have uh, three values for each colors because these are called as primary colors. Any color in the world can be made of these colors. And after that, we have audio. If the audio is there, what we do is we apply what's called as Fourier transform. Okay, it basically uh, contains those frequency coefficients. Okay, and uh, you can visualize these spectrograms also. And then th this is, these, these, these are the basic components of data. So now we can just mix and match these data. Okay, so we can have this data. So it can be either text, it can be uh, either uh, audio, it can be either image, and it can be uh, uh, what we said is. And, and numeric numbers. So let's suppose now if I have to represent anything, I can represent this with the numbers. Let's suppose if I have to represent the human. Okay, it depends on the perspective. So how we de how we define the things now. Let's suppose I have to talk about humans. So what I can say is I can say humans have different features. Okay, humans have different features and each feature will have a value. Each feature will have a value. So now our data is humans. So let's suppose in humans we'll take age, we'll take let's suppose a name, We'll take height, okay, and then probably we'll uh, take weight, and we'll take other things, okay. So if you take this, if you take this as a vector, because age now, if you see, age is a number, okay. Name is a text, height is a number, okay. Weight is a number, 
if I have to uh, define more features in that, so I'll get a good approximation of a human. So this, if you see, is a data point. So this is a data point. So now what this data point is, so age can be converted into a number. So you can, let's suppose, this whole vector will be now a bunch of numbers like 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 2, something like this. Okay, so this is correspond to a human. Let's call this human one because human one will have some values correspond to these. Human two will have values correspond to these. So now, are you convinced that every data that we'll have will be nothing but just bunch of numbers? So who is convinced on this, on this point that data is nothing but numbers in computers? Okay, any questions on this? Any questions? Okay, nice, we didn't have any question. So now at least you are convinced that whatever data we have, uh, at the core level in computers, they are nothing but just numbers. And numbers, how do we represent them? We represent them in vectors. Now see, the mathematics gives you a powerful tool. Because what we have done is, we first read about vectors. And then we read about operations on these vectors. Okay? We read about operations on these vectors. Now we can operate on these vectors. We can manipulate these vectors. Okay? That's, that's, uh, th that's what makes it beautiful. So if you have a vector and if I can just maybe manipulate it in certain ways and c uh, come up with some different things. Okay? So let's suppose uh, that, that's, that's where the power comes from. Because when you convert these things into numbers, okay, then you have operation onto these numbers. And when you uh, apply these operators, you come up with different representations. Okay? And after that, you come up with different algorithms to manipulate. The, the basic thing is that you have vectors and you define operations on these vectors. So this gives an immense power. Okay? So this thing gives an immense power uh, to, the, uh, to the normal people. Let's suppose mathematicians have discovered something. So let's have, after that, if you can, con if you can uh, have a bunch of numbers represent that thing and then you can manipulate it and you can maybe whatever you want to get out of you, you can do that, okay? Now you have, you are done with these vectors and you also know what are these operations. Now we'll see, we'll take an example, okay? Now let's suppose if uh, there is, let's suppose uh, some data. So we have some data which is two dimensional in nature. So what I mean by two dimensional, I mean by two dimensional is that two uh, numbers are required. Probably th these numbers are, let's suppose in uh, real numbers, two numbers are required to represent this data. Okay, let's start, take, take, take a simple example. So how we can, we can take an example where we have, let's suppose, four categories of, four categories of, uh, let's suppose, pea plants or something. I'm just taking a random example. So now if we take the distribution qualities, the first thing is I'll have to see, okay, what are the features in these pea plants? So let's suppose I'll take uh, these pea plants have something, petal length and petal width, something like that. So if you see a pea flower or something, let's call them, uh, four categories of flowers rather than pea plants. So uh, what I said is I'll take two features. Okay, one is petal length and petal width. So if you have seen a flower, there is petals and there are sepals. Okay, so if you have seen a flower, okay, petals basically are those bigger and uh, when you have those smaller sort of leaves, they're called as sepals. Okay, so now I saw a flower. I saw these are different categories, but they somehow look similar. Okay, what I said is okay. If I know the length of petal and width of petal, I can probably distinguish. Let's suppose we have four categories. So four categories, call them category A, category B, category C, and category D, something like this. Or maybe let's suppose not uh, four categories because we are dealing with two dimensions. We can just take two dimensions, two. Okay, two categories, A, B. And now what I'm telling is I have these two features. So these features should somehow represent, okay, what flower, for flower are, the, what flower are, um, are these? So this is A and this is B. These are two categories. These are, the, uh, these are each of the features. If I have flower 1, so let's suppose flower 1 will have, the features will be petal length and petal width. Then we'll have flower 2, and we'll have flower 3, flower 4, flower 5, and so on, until flower n, something like this. Okay? And then we'll have its class also. So which category it belongs, so we call it class. So now these petal length and petal width will have values. Okay, 1.5, 1.6, okay, some in, in some units, 2.4, 3.6, something like this. 4.1, 2.8, let's call this class A, class A, class B, something like this. So if you see this problem, now let's suppose you have this data, and next time when you see a flower, okay, and there was a botanist, let's suppose there was a botanist. So botanist was giving you this problem and he was telling you, these are the flowers, these pretty much look similar, but you, you know that they're of two categories, that they're of category A or category B. So let's name them. So usually we'll take an example. In the subsequent lectures, there is something called as iris data set. So there are different types of flowers. I'll just name some of them. Setos of flower and let's suppose versicolor. Okay, let's call them, this is category A and this is category B. So the point here is, so you have different uh, types of flowers, but they somehow look uh, similar because if, if you see their properties from the naked eye, it'll be very difficult. 
So now what you have to do is you have to extract some features. If you extract the features, you said these two are the distinguishing features. By distinguishing, I mean that they have different values. Okay, why I took humans also? Because if you see, these are distinguishing features of a human. Because age is different for, uh, for most of the humans. Names are different. Height is different. It's very rare if, uh, if we take all the combination, then these uh, will have similar to humans. And then we can also take their facial features. We can also take a lot of stuff which makes the humans unique. So let's suppose here we'll make a problem very simplistic. I'm saying that we have two dimensional vector. By that I mean it has only two distinguishing features. I'm taking petal length and petal width. So in that I'm saying there are these values. And then these describe the classes, class A or class B. Okay, is the data clear so far? This is my data now. So if you see, what I have done basically is, I have done what's called as feature engineering. Feature engineering basically means I'm taking these distinguishing features. So this is one technique called as feature engineering. The second thing that I have done is, I have done what's called as data gathering. So I have also gathered the data. In the machine learning, if you see data is very important. And after that, you are, yeah, you are taking the features. So this is my data. So I have done data gathering. And after that, I have done what's called as feature engineering. But th this is very, uh, this is at, what I can say is, uh, uh, level zero scale. Okay, because we are uh, just taking a toy problem. But this, the concept will be re uh, remain the same once we go to bigger problems. There you will gather data. If you see in chat GPT, what they have done basically is, they first gather the data. And then they have to featureize the data. They have to perform feature engineering. Okay, if you see the, uh, the code of, let's suppose, Llama, or the code of chat GPT, it will be under 1,000 lines. This is the only, much, uh, only, uh, only lines of code you have to write. But the importance lies in here. The power lies in here, okay, in this data. How do they collect data? And how do they perform feature engineering? Okay, this is a huge subject in itself. But here, I just want to tell you this data are just vectors. And now we have this data. Now our point is, Let's suppose if given some new data point, if given some new data point, I'll be given now petal length and petal width. So now the question will be, can you tell me which category does it belong to? Okay, and I just took the example of flowers. This example can be of emails. Okay, because in emails, I can have spam emails and I can have no spam emails, which are called as ham emails. So given a textual information, given an email, I might have to say if it's a spam email or, or, or not a spam email. Because you, you, usually you have seen in Gmail, if you receive an email, there is a folder spam folder. How does it automa How does a mail automatically goes into spam folder? Or how does it, uh, the email come into main inbox if it's not spam? What are the things they basically do? So if you see, this task is called as classification. So in here, per se, we, uh, we specifically uh, this call, call as we call it binary classification. So what is binary classification? If you have a problem in which you have two classes, okay, and you have to distinguish between one another class. So here we took emails as an example, and we also took uh, this uh, flowers, two categories of flowers. And we have to first gather the data. So in the data, after that, we have to do feature engineering. We have to take features which distinguish one category from the other. Okay, now you can see this. So this is our data. So this will be our probably, let's suppose we have to see the data. And if you see how humans learn, we also learn like this, okay? We learn what's called association. Because whole the concept of uh, machine learning was to somehow mimic the human intelligence. They said, let's suppose if there's a child. So what child does is, it learns a lot of things. It takes a lot of inputs. It takes input in the form of text, in the form of audio, in the form of uh, image, okay? In the form of, let's suppose, numbers. Numbers are also text, by the way. Okay, so child basically takes all this information. Now we have the sensory organs. We have sensory organs. So if you see sensory or this text, audio, this is seen by eyes. This is also seen by eyes and this is also seen by eyes. So this is seen by ears. So we have more things than this. So we also have smell. But right till now, till now, see, see, where are we? So this thing we are, uh, we are having numbers represent this. But this smell, we are not yet, we are, uh, we are yet to reach there. Can we quantify smell? How can we uh, have this smell in numbers? Okay, can we generate smell? So this thing is still pending. Okay, then what we have? Sense of touch. Okay, this touch. Still, we are not able to do this. Maybe we are able to do it at, at a very minuscule scale, but still we'll have, because different uh, things feel different, touch feel different, smell also feels different. So here, right now, our science is not built at that scale where we can somehow quantify smell. Okay, we don't have numbers to represent smell. We don't have numbers to represent touch, because this is also data. Touch is data, smell is some data. Okay, if you see this, so this smell, we have nose for it. And for this touch, we have sensory organ skin. So our whole skin yeah, can feel the touch. Okay, now if you see these things, so in here, these things are more than enough, let's suppose text, audio, image, numbers. So what we have is, we try to somehow quantify them. So this is how child learns. So child takes all of this data, child takes this data, 
and then there is some representation in his brain or in her brain. So whenever a child takes the data from the outside world, so there is some representation in his brain. Okay, well, and we don't know what brain is. Brain is a black box for us, and we know very little about the brain. And even if our science has developed so much, but still we know very little about the brain. So this is the motivation that we had in the machine learning. How child learns, how a human learns. So human learns from the data. So if you see, it takes an enormous amount of data every day. Okay, till he sleeps, till he wakes up, and in every time he takes this data. So he takes data, either text, audio, image, numbers, smell, touch. Okay, these sorts of data. And then there is a representation in the brain. There is some representation. And after, uh, we, when once we have this representation, the brain has what is called a generalization capability. capability generalization. So if you just show some uh, dogs to a uh, uh, small chi child, let's suppose you show him some five dogs. So he'll be able to distinguish all the dogs in the world. Okay. So there is some representation, some unique representation in the brain, which tells him this is dog and this is cat. It's very easy for human to distinguish between cats and dogs. Because what, have, what they have seen is they have probably seen few images. They have probably seen few pictures of the dog. And they have also seen some physical dogs here, here and there. But if you show them any kind of dog, any kind of dog, so it's very easy for us to learn, very easy. But what, what's, the, what's the difficulty part that we feel in machines is, the first thing is we had to come with a representation. How, does, uh, how is this cat represented in brain? I don't know, we don't know. So how to represent this in memory? So we have just numbers, so we can represent the numbers. Okay, I told you these, this is shortcoming. So till now we have no means how, I, how we can quantify the smell and how we can quantify the touch. Probably this is, good, this is a good research area. So if somebody wants, to somebody wants to research, probably he can research about this. How to quantify smell or how to quantify touch. If I touch something, how to quantify that. Okay, so maybe there will be some other things which we, uh, which we probably don't know. They're probably latent, we haven't named them. So but whatever we have named, we saw that we can represent them by numbers. So what our brain does, so there is some representation that we do not know. But in mathematics or in machine learning, we try to come with this representation. And this representation for us is just a bunch of numbers. So I was telling you about this classification task. So now, if given images of cats and dogs, okay, we saw three examples. So we saw examples of classification. So what is the, so what is the definition of classification? Classification is if you are given a bunch of classes. So if you are given data and you are given corresponding classes. Okay, data is maybe, let's suppose, uh, one type can be dogs and cats. This data can be given dogs and you can be given image of dogs and cats and the classes will be dogs and cats. You'll have to say if an image is a dog or if an image is a cat. And the second thing which we uh, discovered, we said two category of flowers. Okay, we had uh, Setoza and Versi color. So if given some features about these, we have to tell uh, which uh, is which category okay if given a, a set of features we have to tell if it's uh, set was or if it's worse color then we also took emails so in emails we'll be given email data and there will be spam or no spam okay so this is one task that we do in machine learning that this is called as classification we'll take a detailed look at this but here i just wanted to see i just wanted to show you where these vectors are using okay now each of this thing will be described by vectors if you have a dog dog's image will be a vector if you have a cat it's this will be a dog, corresponding will have a vector. This will be a cat, corresponding to that will have a vector. If we have an email, let's have, let's suppose email one, it will have a vector corresponding to it. If we have a, a set of a flower, or versicular flower, so there will be two numbers, petal length and petal width, that's it. Right. So all in all, what I said is, data is corresponding to vectors. So we'll have these vector representations, okay? And then we'll collect these vector representations. Now, what am I going to teach you? I said that there will be tasks of classification. I took an example in which we have two categories of flowers. We have category A, category B, that is Setoza and Versicolor. So we'll be having data points. Let's, let's, have, let's have flower one. So suppose flower one, the point will be some, petal length will be one, and petal width will be something like this two. Okay, let's have this example. So we'll have this example. So one we have is, uh, one two is uh, one flower. So flower two, let's suppose we have some six flowers. A flower two, flower three, flower four, flower five, and flower six. So these are six flowers, okay? So uh, the value of first is one and two, the value of second is two one, the value of third is three comma three, the value of fourth is minus one four, but uh, uh, petal length is not minus, but I have, uh, like, assume this is minus one, because I, ha I have to show you a graphic visualization, okay? I assume this is negative, it, it can, but, but it is positive. So here I'm saying petal length, I'm uh, considering negative because I have created an example for the demonstration. Okay, but usually the length is not negative. And uh, then we have uh, minus two and five, and then we have minus three and six. 
okay this is our data okay but here for the sake of simplicity what i assumed is length is negative but length never is negative but here for the sake of demonstration i am showing you that okay these are my data so if you see this data is two dimensional data so there are only two numbers that represented okay any questions till now i'll uh, maybe pause here for a second if you have questions please do ask so this is the example that we are doing so we have these uh, this is our data so in the data i told you we have six flowers okay but for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of demonstration i took length as negative which is never possible but bear with me because i have to show you a demonstration so now if you see this data lies in 2d so if i plot this data how i can plot it i can just come up with a two dimension cartesian coordinate and i can plot these because these are my points now okay this is my position okay i, I can just draw points so 1 2 basically means a point is here so 1 2 is right here okay i'll just grab what's called as desmos calculator that's called as desmos so desmos is an online tool where you can basically see all these points so i'll just grab that thing up so in here if you see this is the desmos calculator okay now i have points i have these flowers so i have these flowers if you see the label is 1 2 2 1 and 3 these are the points okay i'll also consider the label so these are the points if you see it over here so these are my three points i have six flowers in total six flowers are these the these the flowers so 1 2 2 3 and 3 1 so these are my one type of flowers so which i have demonstrate over here so this is that so this is one flower this is second flower this is third flower okay Pl flowers are nothing but now bunch of points bunch of vectors so i told you that everything is a vector so now you can just draw from probably a vector from here to here this is a vector so this is one flower this is and the flower okay and from here to here this is and the flower so we have these vectors and these uh, in from computer science principle these are just points okay these are three types these are three flowers i have and then i have uh, defined more three flowers so more three flowers are here minus 1 4 minus 2 5 and minus 3 6 okay these are my uh, three more flowers so in total i have let's suppose six flowers so these are my flowers and the flowers i hope this is visible on the screen so these are my three flowers and these are my three flowers and i know uh, this is of one category so these flowers let's suppose this portion this is of class some class let's suppose call them setosa okay and these types of flowers let's suppose call them as versi color okay if i have to tell you can you somehow give me a method by the help of which i can just separate out these things i can separate out versi color and setosa flowers from each other so what is the best thing that you can say i hope that everybody will agree so they will say we'll draw a line like this probably we'll draw a line like this and whatever falls from here from the line these are versi color and whatever is from on this side is setosa okay does everybody agree with me so if i have to somehow i tell you what are different classes i'll just draw a line i'm saying this line is somehow a line which will separate out the two classes so on one one side this is this is setosa and on other side this is versi color so now if given a point let's suppose i am given a new data point here what do you call this data point now what will you call this data point answer me setosa setosa because it lies on this side of the line okay now if you see the mathematical details that were required the first i have we have most of the details the details that we have we know how to represent this data okay this detail do we have because we have learned about vectors okay and then now the problem comes from here because we have to see mathematically how can we represent this line how can we represent this line so that if given that line i can just tell you if given a point now i'll tell you okay if this if this is a point let's suppose this is a point for me i can say this lies on uh, this side and this is setosa and this lies on the other side this is versi color everybody with me so the only detail that missing is because we know about vectors these are just vectors data is bunch of vectors okay and now this is what is called as decision boundary or decision surfaces okay i'll just close this okay so what we have is now decision boundaries so what is the decision boundary now so if you see the decision boundary the decision boundary is nothing but we, it separates it separates the classes okay so the definition would be a decision boundary is basically a surface or maybe we call it decision surface also it's sometimes called as a hyper surface because it doesn't always lie in uh, one dimension two dimensions or three dimensions it sometimes lies in high dimension also so it is a uh, what i call as hyper surface so what it does is what this hyper surface does is it separates the feature space okay we had this 2d coordinate this was our feature space okay when i drew this line okay and maybe line should be of different color it somehow divided this feature space into two halves if you see this is one half and this is other half okay and maybe let's suppose if we have 2d like this and we have a feature uh, so we have a decision boundary like this okay and this is one half 
and outside is second half. This is the other half. Okay. If you see, what's the decision boundary then by definition? A decision boundary is a surface. It's a hypersurface that separates feature space into different regions. Okay. It, and here we can see it, it, uh, it divides these feature surface into two regions because that's how our surface is. If you can see an apple, I'll give a concrete example. So if you see an apple like this, usually I'm telling you my writing by drawing is very bad. <laughs> that's the reason I'm being computer science major. So this is an apple. So if you see apple has an inside part that you eat. But we call it surface. We have a surface, something surface. So this is my surface of the apple. So whatever I made with the blue, this is surface. So surface are 2D. So if you see apple, surface is 2D. And it also uh, divides the whole world into two parts. Inside apple and outside apple. Inside apple and this is my outside apple. So what surface does basically, if you see the whole world, this is, this is divided. So if I just take this bottle, okay, this is the bottle over here, if you see it. So this is the surface of the bottle. So surface, if I just say, there is internal volume to the bottle and this surface over here. So this is the three, this here is a 2D surface. If I just cut this bottle and I can just lay it down in 2D, okay? And then it separates. What is inside the bottle, that is the bottle and outside the bottle, okay? So basically decision boundary is nothing but it is a hypersurface. Why I call it hypersurface? Because we are able to imagine these things still three dimension. But there will be surfaces which will be in 4D, 5D, and D. Okay, that we don't have imaginative power of that. So, but just one thing necessary is that it somehow divides this feature space. So, this was our feature space. So, in our uh, example of two category of flowers, so our feature space was 2D coordinate system. And because our data points were lying in 2D coordinate system. So, we said, so this line is a decision boundary. So, this line over here. So this line over here is a decision boundary or a decision surface. Why? Because it divides the whole feature space. Okay, whole feature space was divided into two parts. Okay, one is called as, uh, and these are called as half spaces. They're called as half spaces. Okay, and on one half space, probably that's uh, some features are there. On other half space, uh, the other, th other things are there. Okay, and th that's why we use it for classification tasks. So we use it for classification. We just have to come up with a decision boundary. If I come with a decision boundary, decision boundary is nothing, a hypersurface that separates the features, a sp feature space into different regions and corresponding to, and that region is corresponding to each class. So if I now tell you, okay, let's go to go back to that calculator, which is called as Desmos calculator, so that you also can, you can just go on desmos.com, so that you can find it there. So see it here. So now if you see these points, so what we have to do is we can draw a line and that line should somehow divide this whole thing into two half spaces or two half spaces. The first line is somewhat like this. I'm saying that line is this. So this is the line. Okay, there can be infinite many lines, but I'm saying this is one of the lines. So the line can be also this. So this is not, not the only line. So we can have line passing through here also. Okay, we can have line passing through here also. We can have a line like this also. Okay, there, are, there are multiple lines possible. Not just multiple, there are infinite uh, possible lines. But I just took a one. I just took one line among them. Okay, this is that one line. So now this uh, divides this whole feature space into two halves. So one is called as positive half space, and then is called negative half space. Okay, we usually call it the half spaces. Okay, that is the half. This is the first half space. Okay, and this is the second half space. So if you see, these are two half spaces that feature that these have divided. So now if you see whatever lies in this blue half space, okay, it's maybe uh, uh, like some uh, sky blue or something. So whatever lies in this blue half space are vertical of flowers, or, and whatever lies in this gray half space, these are the flowers which are setos of flowers. Okay, and there can be probably and maybe we have these data points which may, may look something different, and decision boundary can be something like this also. The decision boundary can be, this is a quarter decision boundary. So now we are taking just linear decision boundary. So this is my quarter decision boundary. So till now, what I have is, I had this data point. So this was from class one. And I had this data point, which, which was from class two. And what I say is, I have to come with a decision surface. So that, uh, given that surface, that it tells me easily which class, of the, uh, uh, which if I, if, I, if, I, if I am being given a point, so I can easily say that, uh, which uh, class uh, does that point belong to. So for that, I said, we should uh, come up with a line. So line is decision boundary. So this line is a decision boundary. So this divides the whole uh, feature space into two half spaces. Okay, one half space in which these vertical flowers are there and one half space in which these set of flowers are there. So I said, we have these two half spaces. One, this is one half space and this is the other half space. Okay, so so far we are uh, up to this level. Any confusion is still here? Any questions, any confusions? Another, another question that remains is this, how to represent this line? Okay, the question is this, how to represent a line now? 
I should be having a mathematical construct because I have solved this problem partially. So what I have done is I have solved this problem for these points. I said, okay, I have a representation, mathematical representation of these points. So I have a representation of these points. I have a representation of the co coordinate system also. Okay. Now the question remains is that the big question, probably a, more than a million dollar question. So how to represent these things? How to represent these surfaces? Or how to represent these decision boundaries? So that's the question that we'll answer now. Now the question is, We'll call it a billion dollar question because that's what machine, most machine learning is. How to represent these decision boundaries. That's the question now. How to represent these decision boundaries. If we have these points now and the, the, the whole topic now boils down to how to represent these decision boundaries. So now we'll come up to decision boundaries. The first decision boundary that we'll take is a line because we understand points so we'll take line okay we'll take a line so from here please be attentive because this lecture serves as the fundamental lecture for the machine learning so if you somehow understood everything of the lecture you probably have a solid brick of the machine learning with, uh, with you and once you develop the other intuition of machine learning those will be very solid so what is the line now so how to represent this line so if you have seen a line because line lies in a 2d feature space i call it a feature space now if you see my terminology has changed. Initially, I used to call it 2D Cartesian plane. Okay, now I, I am saying this is feature space. So I call it feature space because now I know that my data lies in that and data has features. Okay, and with those three, this is my feature space. So now, if you see a line, so lines are like this, lines are like this, lines are like this. Okay, they are like this. So they are a different line. So if you if I just take one example, so there are only two points are enough. So if I have two points a unique line can be constructed if I have a point here if I have a point here so if I just join these two points together I can construct a line uniquely okay a unique line uh, we, if we have just two points are given to us so we can construct a unique line from that point okay so what are the things that uh, now how do we show this line how do we show okay so uh, how do you show if you have seen if you have read about conic section so we say something y is equal to mx plus c okay so what is this y is equal to mx plus c so this y is the y coordinate and this m is as this is the slope Slope basically is this. I think we have talked in functions, we talked about slope. In, uh, just go to the back to the lecture of functions, we have talked about slope. Slope basically is the angle that it forms with the x-axis in nutshell. Or we call it rise over run. So rise basically is how much is this and how much is this. So this is the run and this is the rise. Rise over run is slope. So usually if I have a point, because now you see this is two-dimensional point. So point can be x1 and y1. So this can be x2, comma y2. So how, what is slope? So this is my rise. Okay, this is my rise. So let's suppose this is the rise and this is my run. So we'll usually write it y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Okay, so this is my whole, if you see from here to here, this is my rise and this is my run between these two points. Okay, so rise over run is this and this is my slope. Okay, if you see this, so this is a right angular triangle. So this over here is a right angular triangle. So this is also equal to tan theta. So this we call as m. So we call this a slope. I am writing two clutter so what I'm saying is we have something called a slope the slope is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 so this is rise or run okay and this is also equal to tan theta and theta over here is angle between between line and x-axis this is our feature space now line is uniquely represented by y is equal to mx plus 2 and uh, that's why the most important thing if you see is the slope the slope only ha we have to have two numbers in order to come up with the slope so that's why we need two data points so the equation of line is y is equal to m x plus c so we know about this because this is y axis coordinate and this is x axis coordinate now we also learned about slope so what is this so this is called as y intercept so what is this y intercept so this y intercept is this much okay so if i have different line so i can have line like this so here, this will be y-intercept. So y-intercept is how from the origin, how can, if we have a line like this, y is equal to mx. So this is for sure going through origin. This is going through origin. So if you have y is equal to mx plus c, so this basically is nothing, this is our y-intercept. y-intercept. This is the equation of line. So usually how do we write it? So what you will do is, so you will write something like this. You will say w naught plus w1 x1 plus w2 uh, maybe just one is equal to 
uh, let's suppose we we'll write it plus w2 x2 is equal to 0. We'll write something like this. So this is equation of line equation of line. This is exactly the same as y is equal to mx plus c. Why I just what I just changed is I changed this x1 because now I cannot use x, y, z. So I use this x1 and I use this x2. Mm, yes, I use this x2. So these two are basically x and y's. Okay. So here it was x and it was y. So these were my uh, variables which can vary. So I just named them as x1 and x2. So now I can show you that these two equations are equivalent. So if I write something like this. So if I write uh, w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to 0. So what I, how I can rewrite this equation is uh, I'll keep this x1 on one side. So this is w1 x1 is equal minus of w2 x2 minus w0. Okay, so this x1 is equal to minus w2 by w1 x2 minus w0 divided by w1. So let's call this as y. Okay, let's call this as c. Let's call this as slope m and else let's call this x. So this is again y is equal to mx plus c. So these two equations are similar. Okay, this is like the generic way of writing it. So instead of these coefficients, I wrote w0 is this w1, w2, and so why why am I writing it like this? So why am I writing it? Why am I just doing those uh, maybe some uh, magic or some trickery? Why am I doing it? Because it will make the representation easy. It, if you see this, so now equation of light that equation of line that I have written equation of line that I have written is like this: w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to zero. And I showed you this is equivalent to this equation is equivalent to y is equal to mx plus c. That's how we represent the equation. Now the uh, trickery that I did is I wrote it in some different fashion. So why? So let me just show you why. So I can write this equation as, so if I have a vector w, call that w vector. And what I can write is because by default vector is like this. So I can write w1 and w2 like this, this is a vector. So if I have a vector like x like this, capital X, so I can write x like this, x1 and x2. Okay. So what, how I can transform this equation is I can write w transpose x plus w naught is equal to 0. Can I write like this because this is just dot product. Okay, W transposes W1, W2. Okay, X is X1, X2. I should write capital X like this. And this is plus W0, this is equal to 0. So if I just perform the dot product, it'll, it'll come to out, out to be this. Is everyone clear with this? Is everyone clear with this? Any confusions? Because I am going into mathemat a bit of mathematical details. I should, I should not confuse you at this point. <laughs> it took a lot of time to reach here. So I am saying, this y is equal to mx plus c equation is equivalent to this equation. Now, do not forget the big question. The big question, billion dollar question was how to represent the decision surfaces. So we saw one decision surface can be a line. Okay, how the line represent? That is y is equal to mx plus c. That's how a line is represent. I said, okay, let me represent it in some other fashion. So how I represent that is like this. I said, I can write it w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to zero. So I said this equation is equivalent to the original equation that we actually have. And now, what it gives me, it gives me immense power. I can say, I can just separate out two vectors. I can say W is a vector, X is a vector. Okay. I can write W transpose X plus W naught is equal to zero. Okay. And this is the equation of line. So now if you see that this is somewhat, these are data points, these axes are data points and this is called as normal vector. So if you see, if I just have a line like this, I'll have a vector W like this. This is my W and these are my X. Okay, so this is my w, this is my x. So if given some axis, so if I, if you can give me this w transpose x, which basically plus w naught, so w naught is li li again like an intercept, is equal to zero. If I don't worry about the intercept, so my line basically is w transpose x is equal to zero, if you see this. So this w vector is normal vector. Why is it normal? So if you see w transpose x is equal to zero. So why is it normal now? Because dot product is normal. So dot product is equal to zero. So this tells me the angle between this W transfer X should be zero. So if, if uh, uh, angle should be 90, sorry, angle should be 90 because they're dot product because we have learned about dot product. So dot product was telling me that if we have vectors A, if we have vectors B, if A dot B is equal to zero, that means A is perpendicular to B, A is orthogonal to B. So I'm saying is, let's suppose we'll make this uh, pass through the origin. I'm just uh, canceling this W naught. If I have any line, let's suppose, so let's suppose line is like this. So what I can do is I can move whole of this sphere. I can move this or I can move the line. I can just make it pass through the origin. Okay. Or uh, if it's like this, just give me a sec. 
So if let's suppose this is the line, so what I can do is I can move the line itself. I can move the line. I can move the line at the origin. Okay, this is called as what is called affine transformation. I'm just moving the line. I'm making no change to the line. Either I am moving the line or I'm moving the Cartesian plane, one and the same thing. So this basically gives me a simpler equation. This gives me W transpose X is equal to zero. Initially what I had is I had W transpose X plus W naught is equal to zero. So this W naught was that intercept uh, part. So I said, can I write it like this? I can write W transpose X is equal to zero because I'll shift the line. Okay, I'll shift the line. So what this tells me, this tells me that this vector W transpose and X vector, they're orthogonal. So they form a 90 degree angle. Okay, so that's what I have shown here. If you have a line and if you have this line and if you have this W, so this W is perpendicular to the line. So if you give me this normal, this is called as normal vector. And this is normal vector. So now if you give me this normal vector, I can give you a line uniquely. So let's suppose if you give me this normal vector 1, 2. Okay, you can give me a normal vector 1, 2. I can tell you, let's suppose W0 is 0 by default. So I am saying you 1 times x1 plus 2 times x2 is equal to 0. So this is a line. Okay, this is a line. Okay, if, if you just give me this W vector, if you give me this W vector, I can give you the line. So because now, how to represent these vectors? Now you have to give me this normal vector. You have to give me W vector. So if you give me W, I can give you a line uniquely. Let's go to Desmos calculator again and we'll write equations like this. Just give me a second. Any questions till that, I'll take those. So what I'm saying is, so the equation that was y is equal to mx plus c. So what I said is we have an equivalent equation, w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to 0. This is the equivalent equation. Okay, but this gives me an immense power. So what this gives me, I can write equation like this. I can say W transpose X plus W naught is equal to zero. So Y W is equal to W1 and W2. And this X is equal to X1 and X2. Okay, that's why I wrote W transpose. So W transpose will be written like this. So this is W1, W2, this is a vector. X1, X2 like this. And this is W naught, this is equal to zero. So now if you perform dot product, you will come here. Okay, now what I said is, I can perform the affine transformations. If I have given, I can just cut out this W. Why? For the sake of simplicity and for the sake of visualizations. I can write W transpose X is equal to zero. So this is the equation of line. Equation of line in 2D. And this is in 2D, by the way. Line is defined for 2D. Okay, W transpose X is equal to zero is equation of line. So what I'm saying you, how to now uniquely, uh, the question that we are answering is how to quantify those decision boundaries. What is the mathematical constraint? I'm telling you, if you give me this W, okay, because X1 is X1 and X2, I know this. This is my variables. Okay, if you give me this W, so W, uh, I can uniquely construct a line. So I said, okay, let's take W example as one, two. This is my example, one, two. So how to write this now? Because I know I can write it as W one times X1 plus two times x2 is equal to zero. This should be a line, okay? So in Desmos calculator, I'll just replace this and this by x and y, okay? That's what the, that's the substitution. Okay, I say, I'll write x plus two y is equal to zero. So this should give me a line. So what I'm saying is, if you give me a unique w, I'll give you a unique line. Let's go to that calculator, okay? Let's go to that calculator. Here is that calculator, if you see. So what I'll write, I'll write an equation. So if you see over here, I'll write this equation. So just check. This equation, I'll write this equation over here at the top. What I'm writing is I'm writing y plus 2x. So this y basically is my x1. This y is my x1. This x is my x2. And these coefficients are my w vectors. So this is 1y plus 2x is equal to 0. Okay, because you gave me a you gave me a unique w. So if you see this is the equation where I'm writing it, this is the equation. So I'm writing 1y plus 2x is equal to 0. So this base y and x is x1 and x2. So I'm writing 1x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 0. So what you gave me was w. So w was 1 and 2. I said I'll give you a line uniquely. So if I just draw this line, okay, if I draw this line now, you can see. If I just click on the draw line, you will see this is the line. If I now change the w, if I change the w like this, I change the w to 4 and 5, okay, the line should get changed. And so this, this line should change. So I should change this to 4. I'll give it 4 value and I'll give this 5 value. You see the line is changing. If I give this value 7, Okay, so now we somehow uh, have a w have a way to demonstrate this line. So what I'm saying is, so for line you should give me this w vector, which I call as normal vector. So why did I say normal vector? Because w transpose x is equal to zero. So this is a dot product. Okay, if this is dot product, if this is equal to zero, so that means cos of theta is equal to 90 degrees. Uh, this is equal to uh, because this dot product is AB 
a dot b cos theta so if you take the theta if you take uh, the value of theta from here so theta you will get as 90 degree because the uh, this dot product is equal to 0 okay whatever the magnitude is so if cos theta is equal to 0 that means theta is equal to 90 degrees that's why I'm saying this is a normal vector w transpose is a normal vector to this x x so now we have one thing so what we have is so we have if we are given vector w vector w we will be able to able to construct a line okay so if you are given this w now so w vector is so here we have a line so it will be w1 and w2 if you are given these values so you will be able to construct line that we showed in the desmos calculator now the line is in 2d so what is in 3d can you tell me what is in 3d so can you tell me what is in 3d if line is in 2d what should be in 3d so now we have this w vector will be something like this w1 w2 and w3 okay and then we'll have 3d cartesian plane we'll have three axes x y and z so if a line is in uh, 2d what should be in 3d any answers i think was the answer plane yes yes plane right nice so plane will be like this so a plane surface will be something like this a plane again the plane will have a vector w then like this because we said w transpose x is equal to zero see the beauty of maths we can generalize it to anything now because we just derived it for line so what we can write is we can write w naught plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 is equal to zero and this w vector over here is w1 w2 and w3 and this x vector over here is x1 x2 and x3 because we are able to visualize this we can say x y and z okay and these are the coefficients corresponding coefficients so we can write w transpose x plus w naught is equal to zero we can again make the a plane shift so we can just drop this term we can say w transpose x is equal to zero so this is equation of a plane also same equation but what's the difference the difference is this w and x is now you saw the trickery that I did that time. I said, let's make a generic equation. Okay, this is the equation of plane. So whatever it is in 4D, now 4D we can't imagine, 5D we can't imagine, ND we can't imagine. But mathematics can still give you the tools because we discovered tool for 2D, 3D, but we can generalize it to any n dimension. And we call these as hyperplanes because they lie in uh, the dimensions which we can't imagine. They lie in some higher dimensional space. So we call them hyperplanes. So what is, let's suppose if we have to draw if we now have a line, if we have this hyperplane in, let's suppose, ND, so how to draw that? W0 plus W1X1 plus W2X2 and so on till WNXN is equal to 0. Dropping this W0, we'll write W transpose X is equal to 0. Okay, if you have 3D, so your plane will be like this, so let's suppose, like this. I'll just make it. Okay, and I'll make a plane like this. So this is first half space and this is the next half space. And then there will be a vector which is perpendicular. This is called as W vector. Okay. So for these planes, lines, we if we give me this W transpose vector and whatever dimension you give it to me. If it is 2D, I, I'll construct a line. If it is 3D, I'll construct a plane. If it is 4, 5, ND, I'll construct a hyperplane. Okay. But this W is unique. Okay. So if you now see this, now if you have this line, if W transpose X, okay is equal to zero so this is the plane now see the beauty of maths again now the question was uh, we have this plane or maybe line so the question was we had line like this and we had w vector like this so this was our w vector this was the w vector so if you see some points were here okay and some points were here so now how to distinguish between these two points now we have a mathematical equation we are saying w transpose x is this is equal to zero is this line okay how to distinguish these points because these points lie above this line okay and they lie on the same side if you take that w transpose x will be the value of these points okay and then you say if it is greater than zero that means dot product is greater than zero okay if dot product is positive that means these both lie on the same side this w vector and this vector okay because this is a vector this x is a vector now okay? and this vector and this vector if they lie on the same side they'll give a positive value okay if this is greater than zero so it is a positive point Let's call this positive. That's why this is called as positive half space. So this side is called as positive half space. 
Now, if you see, if I have n the x, so n the x will be, let's take this random point. So this will be a vector x, so this will be a x. W and x are in the opposite directions. They're at 180 degree angle. So if you see, w transpose x will be less than 0. So it will give a negative value. That's why it will be a negative point. OK, that's why it's called as negative half space. OK, so now we have a classifier thing. So if you give me this wt vector, I can tell you, I can give you a classification thing. Okay, so here you just give me w vector. So w vector in uh, in our example that was probably one two. This was my w vector. So what I can say is, if you give me w, if you now give me any any point, now x point is also. Let's suppose I give you petal length and petal width. That can be the value can be two comma three. Okay, now if I perform dot product w transpose x, if I perform that, okay, so what will be the value? So one and two multiplied by two three. So this will be equal to. 1, 2 is a 2 plus, 2, 3 is a 6, this is equal to 8, and 8 is positive. So it's for sure short that this point will lie on this side. Okay, now let's go to Desmos calculator. I'll show you those things again. I know I'm a bit fast, but it's all right. You have to visit this lecture again. If you see this, this is the Desmos calculator I came here. So these were the points initially. I had these points, okay, these are the labels, and I had these points, okay, and these are the labels. So this was my positive half space and this was my negative half space okay and this was my line so this over here is my line so I'll just draw that line so that line was 2x plus 2, two y is equal to 2x plus 2 let me just write, write that is equal to this is that line green and this is the region and then what we'll have is we have this w vector basically so here we have a w vector so what is that w that w is perpendicular the first thing is this w is perpendicular to this let me draw a perpendicular line this is very bad this is my w let's suppose and this is w and what's the value of w this is 2 and 2 this is the my w vector now any point which lies on this side okay any point because now I, if I perform the affine transformation I, I have not performed affine transformation I should make it go through the origin okay but if you see that dot product of this so basically now we should get w transpose x plus w naught if that is greater than zero so these are those points so for these points this value is greater than zero okay and for these points okay for these points w transpose x plus w naught because here we have w naught also and this if this is less than zero then this is negative half space so this is my negative half space and this is my positive half space okay who has understood at least something uh, ab uh, something about these decision boundaries so far are you clear with these decision boundaries not 100 percent clear but are you clear how do we uh, give, assign these how do we define these boundaries in the mathematics i'll just pause here for a second i'll take your questions so we got two questions the first question question one was why do we write w naught plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to zero like this why do we let, write it equal to zero so what this basically tells you this x1 and x2 this is this, this is a point so we have point or maybe a data point whatever it is data is two dimensional we have these values two points so if i have these points so i'm saying you lines like this okay this is the data point so all these points which lie on the line which lie on the line okay they have this value equal to zero so if you uh, if you take any point from this line and you put these values in this equation, you'll get equal to zero. So why this? Because you know that line is just a bunch of points. So okay, if, if this is a bunch of points, so any point lying on this line, so the value for that point should be equal to zero. That's why we wrote w naught plus w1, x1 plus w2, x2 is, is equal to zero. So these are the points which lie on the line. Then I said if it lies above the line, above the line. So this again will compute some sort of distance. So I said this, this is the w vector, which uniquely identifies the plane. Okay, and they lie on the same, same side. Now you see that this value will be positive. So if you see w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2, so this will be greater than 0. This is above, above the hyperplane. So why am I writing above the hyperplane? Because now this can be a line in 2D, plane in 3D, and then in 4D, 5D, we have these n-dimensional spaces. So again, if you see this w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2, if this is less than 0, so that means they lie, lie below the plane. So this is above the plane, and this is below the plane, below the hyperplane. Okay, and these are the points. So this is this. So this region. So they'll define a region. So if you draw a line, line was like this. So this region over here. So this region in the blue. So this is 
negative half space. So that's why it's called negative half space. Why? Because the value comes comes out to be negative. Okay, this is negative value. So if you just see this, this red region, so this is positive half space. Positive half space. Okay, because value comes out to be positive. That is the first question. For equal to zero, because these points lie on the plane. Okay? And this is question one. The question two that was asked is that uh, if we have this w naught plus, uh, plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 is equal to 0. Okay, this, the question was that if I give you this w1 and w2 vector then, so does it mean that I give you uh, uniquely the plane? That's what I was uh, telling. So if you have this vector w like this, okay, let's call it, this is in 2D. So now only one line will be perpendicular to this. In 2D only one line, that line will be like this. Okay, so if you give me this w1 and you give me this w2 and you give me this w0, so I will separate what w0 is for, but this w1 and w2 is this perpendicular vector and there will be only one line which will be, which will be, which will be perpendicular to this w vector. Okay, so this is that vector. So this is my w and this is that, that line which is perpendicular. Now I'm saying what is this w0 for? This w0 is basically for uh, where it starts. So if you take this 2D, so if you take w0 is equal to 0, so I said that, You'll start from origin. If this this is this is your w, w means w1 and w2. This is your one vector. So the only vector that is perpendicular is probably this vector. So this is the vector. Let's call this x. Okay, this is my line. So this line uh, is perpendicular to this w2, w1. This this w1 and w2. So now what is this w0 for? So because this w0 is zero, it was starting from origin. If you want to make a line like this, which is not going through origin, which is going somewhere like this. So for that, you see the distances there. So that's why this W0 comes into picture. So W0 basically tells you where to start, where to start the vector. So this is your W0. So starting point is this W0. So W0 basically tells you, it, it, uh, it tells you that where you have this transformation. It might not start with zero. It might not pass through origin. You can have lines which does not pass through origin. That's what this W0 signifies, okay? And this W is the normal vector. This is the, what this is called as normal vector and in deep plane it's called as weight vector. And it uniquely identifies a plane or a hyperplane or uh, a 2D line. Yes, yes. You have questions? Yes, Fahad. Can we just go to the plane? Yes, yeah, so as you saw that now we have these uh, decision boundaries. So in decision boundaries, so we said uh, we have a line that is in 2D. In 3D, we have a plane. Okay, and then we have in ND, we have what's called as hyperplane. And the equation we wrote is W transpose X plus W naught is equal to zero. That's what we saw. Okay. And there can be a lot other decision boundaries. Okay. So what can be there? That can be, let's suppose now circles can be there also. So if a data is there like this, so you have some points are like this and some points are like this. So okay, if I, if I can draw a circle like this, somehow this will be my decision boundary. This is my decision boundary i can separate out the positive classes from the neg negative class basically what i can do is i can just separate out these two half spaces because decision boundary is by definition that in which you can uh, divide the feature space into different regions so what is the equation of circle so if you know the equation of circle so equation of circle is x minus h whole square plus y minus k whole square is equal to r square okay uh, so this x and uh, this h and k is my where the origin lies and this r is the radius so if this is the circle, I'll make a terrible circle, something like this, let's suppose. This is my circle. So let's suppose this is my origin. So this origin is h comma k. Okay, and this is my radius, this is r. So this is the equation which describes that. Okay, now if you have to do it, basically this is my circle. Circle in 2D. So in sphere it will be 3D. So in 3D it will become a sphere. Okay. So in that, what we will have to do is, you will say x minus h whole square plus, this is y minus y minus k whole square a, is equal to r square. And then we'll have plus one more. We'll have z minus, let's suppose, uh, h, k, n something, whole square is equal to r square. So this is a sphere now. So sphere will look something in 3D. So sphere will be a ball. And this is the origin. Origin is h comma k comma, uh, whatever I wrote, this is n. N and this is my R. Okay, so I'll generalize the equation again. So now it's we'll have hypersphere also. So what I'm saying is I can write it like this. This is X, these are my points, X, Y, and Z. I can write them as X1 minus. So this origin point, I can write it as H1. X1, H1 whole square plus X2 minus H2 whole square plus 
x3 minus h3 whole square and this is equal to r square. This is my sphere. Okay, what what about uh, hypersphere? Let's suppose in ND. Now we'll just have this xi minus hi whole square i goes from 1 to n is equal to r square. So this will be hypersphere, equation of hypersphere. So what, what is the origin? Origin will be h1, h2 till hn. So this will be my origin and this is r is my radius. So this is for hypersphere. Okay, let me write this. This is visible. This is hypersphere. Okay, circle in 3D is basically a sphere. So that sphere also can be uh, thought as a decision boundary. So you can have ellipses also. You can have ellipse in 2D. You can have in 3D that's called as ellipsoid. And in ND, we call that hyper hyper ellipse or hyper ellipsoid. I'm just writing too lazy to write these spellings and you can get the equation so equation uh, you can just check online the equations for these it's very easy now so now there will be mathematical equations and we have we can have ellipse ellipse basically is like this okay ellipse is where we have this is called as minor this is called as major minor x and major axis and then we have an origin also there so we have an origin so when you have this in 3d you have ellipsoid like a rugby ball that's ellipsoid and our earth is also ellipsoid earth is like ellipsoid because earth is 3D shape and it is ellipsoid. So you have an equation for that also. So the equation for that is x minus h whole square divided by a square plus y minus k whole square divided by b square. That's equal to 1. This is for ellipse. This is my origin again. This h and k is my origin. This is my major and minor axis. Major and minor axis value and this is that 1. So you can, you can write it like this. Okay. And ellipsoid you can just change and you can just add keep on adding dimensions. Okay. So in summary, what we have seen, and you can also have, you can also have squares, you can also have rectangles, okay? You can have different figures, and for all these figures, you can come with the equations. Now, so for decision boundary, for decision boundary, the main concept is that it divides feature space. So okay, we have feature space. It divides feature space into different regions, into different regions. And we saw different. And for the for uh, the corresponding thing is the question was how to how to describe decision boundaries mathematically. So we also saw that how to describe them mathematically. Okay, and we had a dis detailed discussion on line, and we had discussion on plane and hyperplane. And in that we saw what are positive half space, negative half because it's easy to imagine. But you can have decision boundaries like this also, where we uh, discussed about circle. And where we discussed about uh, sphere in 3D circle and then sphere. And for ND, we'll call it a hypersphere. And then uh, we'll have ellipse, ellipsoid in 3D and hyper ellipsoid in ND. And equations will be accordingly. And then we'll have, uh, we'll also have square. And then we'll have hyper square also. Okay. And we can't imagine them. We'll have rectangle, hyper rectangle. And th there will be corresponding equation to these. And it's easy to find just a click away. But you know the template. The template is you have a decision boundary. And decision boundary is somehow described mathematically. And we have discussed about this and for other things that you can probably either give into an assignment or maybe you can just check them uh, by yourself and see how to represent them. And I showed some of the equations. So here it covers the basics of algebra. And in the next session, what I'm telling you is we'll uh, cover functions, whatever the part we have left of functions, then we'll cover some libraries. So libraries will be uh, NumPy and Pandas also because we need to read data and numpy pandas and then matplotlib matplotlib and then seaborn once we have this and once we have this background so we'll come back to these things because we'll write the code for visualization what are we have studied so far we have studied point vector this is uh, distance between these vectors distance from the origin and then we wrote about these surfaces everything will code will code and will visualize each of these things so that probably it will require one to one and a half lecture maybe two lectures to visualize and this will make the foundation rock solid because this is where you will learn the most of the things because you will have to first understand the theory part and then bring into the computers and then visualize the things so here but for that We'll just cover the functions so that our basic Python is done. And then for easy manipulation, we'll require these libraries. Okay, and these libraries are not even required. But uh, the thing is, they have very easy operators. Otherwise, you'll have to write operators from scratch. It will become very difficult. Okay, NumPy has good manipulation things. And by Pandas, you can read these data. Th data. 
and matplotlib has great visualization tools and also the seaborn has the same thing as matplotlib so if you know these libraries then you can uh, do the visualizations on your own okay with this we'll end today's lecture and if you have any questions i'll take those